Welcome to this week's episode of Promising Young Surgeon. This week, we will discuss common cognitive distortions and how they can surreptitiously affect our thought patterns. Then, Dr. Brittany Bussey joins us to discuss overcoming career setbacks and her extraordinary journey after being forced out of a surgical residency program. Before we even get to the cognitive distortions, I do want to share a little bit of an update. I know that on this show, we do talk a little bit about the literature that highlights differences between female and male physicians, their practices, the amount of time that they spend with patients, and even some surgical outcomes, because those have all been published in the past couple of years. But I had the most interesting thing come through clinic several weeks ago. And it, you know, it has been haunting me a little bit, but I had this wonderful patient, nicest lady. She was like in her sixties and she came in for these persistent chronic neck symptoms. She was having globus sensation, which is where it feels like something stuck in your throat, even though nothing's there and tightness of her neck, things like that. And it was even affecting her swallow a little bit, making it feel like things were getting stuck or, you know, again, the swallow did not feel normal to her. And so she was just sent to me to kind of get that all checked out. Okay, well, that's easy. This has been going on for years and years. So that is an automatic laryngoscopy in clinic. We put a very small camera through the nose, down the back of the nose, and then can look down at the voice box that way. And it's really, it's easy. It's under a minute. People do well with that in general. So we go ahead and we do it. And she had this, you know, she had this very significant fungal laryngitis. She had superglottic squeeze. You know, we're not going to get into all those technical terms today because it's not pertinent to the point that I want to make, but very real anatomic, physiologic, very literal disease was present on multiple levels. And here's what was so interesting. I went over everything with the patient and she was like moved to tears. And she told me, She'd been having this going on for over 10 years, had seen multiple physicians for this, and her whole experience had been that she was told, without ever having a scope exam at any point, that she had a diagnosis of hysterical laryngitis. Uh, That is... That is not really a modern diagnosis. I had personally never run across that before, and of course, you know, it just sounds like kind of a scientific way for someone to say, you're just hysterical and you don't have laryngitis, you know, or maybe some strain related to psychosomatic disease or something like that. But I really do. I think that that case, like that does haunt me. I hate that she went so many years with a diagnosis of hysterical laryngitis when she has like multiple physical treatable conditions. And I just think that it helps highlight these areas where we can do better in medicine, listening to properly working up and, you know, getting patients down these treatment pathways. Alrighty. So let's jump into a few common cognitive distortions today. Here's why it matters. Because recognizing your thought distortions is the first step to changing them and making your mind a better place to live, more inhabitable and perhaps less hostile. They can also get in the way of us acting skillfully at work. And so, for instance, even if you are in a position where you know the interpersonal effectiveness skills, you want to use them at work. You're trying to, you know, build positive reciprocal relationships with people that you work with. Well, guess what? Thought distortions can get in the way. They can make it more difficult to implement those. And so we'll go through some of these today. The first, you know, many people will at least be able to relate to this or find it familiar, but the first is catastrophizing. That's jumping to conclusions where you predict a severely negative outcome, even without evidence that it's the most likely one. For example, I'm definitely going to fail this test. Mind reading. This one is particularly common in high-stress work environments, and it's where you interpret an event or a situation negatively without evidence to support that conclusion. So for instance, let's say that somebody at the hospital snaps at you. Your mind starts to race about what you could have done wrong. In reality, most of the time, people are not thinking about you, and the behavior of snapping at you in passing is more about the person who does it and how their day is going 
than it is about you. And for example, an example of mind reading in that situation would be if you just think, you walk away from that saying, okay, my attending thinks I'm incompetent. That doctor thinks I'm incompetent. Overgeneralizing is where a blanket negative conclusion is made that goes far beyond the current situation, often includes words such as always, never, or nothing. For example, since the first week of MS3 rotations has gone so poorly, this whole year will suck. Should statements. I do want to take a little extra time to highlight the should statements because, yes, they're insidious, they're hard to get rid of, but I think that once you really start paying attention, you'll see how often you do it. So again, they're hard to challenge, but what the should statements do is create a rigid idea of how you or others should behave. Begin by noticing how many times a day you think or say, I should, or he, she, they should. Try to change should to a preference, to a choice. You can learn to relate to your values differently so that when they're not reflected in the world, it's not perceived as an existential threat. Because here's the thing, is if you believe truly that something, quote unquote, should be, and then it's not, it doesn't match up with reality, then that can be extraordinarily painful. So an example I like, this comes up a lot, is just saying instead of, quote, I should stay late to help out with this late admission. It's, I choose to stay late to help out the team. Taking ownership of your decisions really does help you feel better about them. And we do all have agency. And, you know, it's not like, oh, this team member or like my program is forcing me to cover this case late. It's like you are choosing to be there because you could always, you know, you could always say, no, I'm not going to do that. You know, we're all adults with agency. And so this is an important point to remember. Fallacy of fairness. This is where you measure every behavior and situation on a spectrum of fairness. The reality is that everyone's definition of what's fair is different. And also, in reality, the world can often be unfair. For example, even though your performance may be commensurate with another student on a rotation in medical school, you guys get the same exam score. You perform the same duties, but they received honors and you don't based on a subjective call, right? It can be really easy to make yourself miserable perceiving some slight, whether it's in class or in the hospital. And, you know, another example that I really like that comes up in residency is the distribution and assignment of surgical cases. Because, of course, there's a variety of different cases rolling to the OR every day. We have an admin chief who assigns the cases. Okay, it would be nearly impossible to assign cases in a 100% equitably distributed fashion, right? And it's easy to make yourself miserable by saying, well, how come that person got that case? And, you know, now I'm covering this kind of a case. We tend to think about what we deserve. Here's what's really important to remember. There are a lot of things that have broken in our favor to get to this point. And we tend not to focus on those. Try not to get hung up on the breaks that are not in your favor. Kind of try that on for size. I think that that was, you know, this kind of pep talk was one of the things that really did help me start to begin the long journey of shifting my thinking. Blaming. Blaming is where you make others responsible for how you feel. For instance, if an attending makes a negative comment towards you on morning rounds, then you feel upset for the rest of the day. You think, you made me feel bad about myself. Instead of just assigning blame externally or thinking, you know, I'm stuck here, I have no choice but to stay, I'm already on this path. Again, this goes back to our agency and taking ownership of our decisions. It's, I'm choosing to stay on this path to becoming a physician, so I'll square up and stay here. Finally, We have the fallacy of change. This is a fallacy where you expect other people to change or meet your expectations or needs, especially if you pressure them enough. For example, let's say that you ask a colleague to discontinue berating staff on one of the units. You expect them to hear and understand what you're saying and to change their behavior accordingly. At the end of the day, the only person whose actions and words you have control over are your own. And 
that's really important to m remember because you can kind of prioritize accordingly. That is to say, one of the best ways to start a different conversation or change the culture is to be a different kind of leader and kind of demonstrate an alternative behavior yourself, right? People do learn by, by watching you. That's true at all levels and stages of our medical training on the path to becoming a physician and a surgeon. Like even when we're in medical school, like there are a lot of pre-meds who are going to look up to you. You know, there's high schoolers who may look up to you and maybe shadowing and things like that. So at all levels, like we are being watched and our behavior may be replicated someday. So I just think that that's also worth remembering and having a little bit of perspective on. Alrighty, so now that we've gone through some of these common cognitive distortions that certainly can impact our day and our work as healthcare workers, we're going to jump into our discussion with our guest, Dr. Bussey. Dr. Brittany Bussey is a physician, digital health expert, and she is the co-founder, president, and chief medical officer of Vitel Health. Vitel Health was founded in 2020, enabling whole person preventative care via telehealth services. In addition to her work as a physician leader, she enjoys practicing and teaching yoga and meditation, spending time with her partner and son, and exploring Northern California. Thank you so much for joining me today, Dr. Bussey. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk to you and your uh, group here. Well, I would love to open with hearing more about your journey into medicine. Like what made you want to become a doctor and then what led you to want to pursue surgical residency? Sure. Um, so I grew up in a family where my mom was a nurse, actually. Um, no other doctors in the family, but I was really interested in taking care of other people, helping other people. And my mom was kind of funny because she was like, well, honey, you are so smart. She was like, you need to be a doctor. Like, don't be a nurse like me because really smart people go to medical school. <laughs> and I was like, okay, mom. And like nothing against nurses. I love nurses. That was just kind of her point of view on mm -hmm. the situation. Um, so I kind of toyed around with different things growing up. Like I thought the heart was really interesting. So I thought at first maybe I would like to be a heart surgeon. Um, but then I realized it was really kind of bloody and scary, um, at least for a kid. And then I thought maybe brain surgery would be a lot cleaner. At least it looked cleaner on TV. Um, and so I found out that wasn't really the case either. And the funny part was as I was going through all of these things um, and discovering like I was really interested in the brain and how the brain works and reading, my mom was a psychiatric nurse. So she had a bunch of like really crazy old psychiatric books from like the seventies. Oh, wow. uh, really interesting what people did in psychiatric care back then. Um, and I thought, well, maybe I would be interested in that. So when I went to medical school, actually before medical school as an undergrad, I actually majored in psychology and in physiology also, like a double major. And then I went to the University of Wisconsin-Madison thinking I would probably go into psychiatry. We all started our rotations, as we know, in our third year of medical school. And I did psychiatry first. So I was like, I just can't wait to like do psychiatry and practice. And it was so disappointing. <laughs> like I have never been so disappointed in my life. I felt like like nobody seemed like they were asking interesting questions. Like it just was a bunch of like, did you take your pills today? How did they make you feel? Well, you've been taking this one pill for two weeks and doesn't seem to be working. So let's try this other pill. And I was like, wow, this is just the opposite of what I want to do with my life. Probably so, not as interesting as what they were doing in the 70s for it. No. <laughs> and honestly, like even in like the 80s and early 90s, I mean, we think of things like Dr. Fraser Crane and like he would actually talk to the patients and be like, I'm listening. And like nobody was listening. There was no talking, no listening, no like real like connection I felt like happening in that short period. And I kind of had the same experience going through internal medicine and family medicine and OBGYN and all of those things. I just, it didn't resonate with me. Like I don't really take medication myself and I just couldn't see myself prescribing pills to people for the rest of my life. So when I got to my surgical rotation, I was like, uh, this might not be good because I've been known to pass out when I see blood. And I remember I avoided going to the OR for like almost the entire first week of like an eight week rotation. 
And I would just follow the intern around everywhere because she just had a bunch of paperwork to do and mm-hmm. like nobody would bother her. And then all of a sudden she gets a page that she gets to go to the OR and she's so excited. She's going to drag me along with her. <laughs> and I just practically panicked. Um, so I get pulled into this hernia repair surgery, gowned up, like totally afraid to touch anything. Like, oh my God, I'm going to break something. And uh, they have the patient all covered up. And there are blue drapes anywhere. Obviously, all of these surgical residents totally are <laughs> um, picturing this right now. You know, you have your blue drapes and you have a clean square of skin for this hernia repair. And it was so, like, beautiful and perfect. And although you know there's a person there, like, with the blood and everything being detached from a person, it didn't cause me the same like vasovagal reaction that I had had, like even seeing dialysis, like when the blood was like mm. out of the person and then going through the machine and going back in, yeah. I just, my whole body just shut down. But there was just this sense of calm control that came with the atmosphere of the room. And the person came in with a problem and they left without a problem. And I learned of the surgeon motto, a chance to cut is a chance to cure. And I was just like, that is it for me. Like, I can do this all day. Like, this is what I want to do. Um, and I just went to like every surgery I could find after that. And uh, went through all different kinds of rotations um, and ended up doing like some orthopedic shadowing and really interested in plastics And, um, I had really high scores, so it wasn't really like an issue for me, like choosing a more competitive specialty at that point. Um, I guess I kind of, you know, lucked out in that sense that like I was, I was well positioned, um, from a standardized testing standpoint to choose any specialty I wanted. So, um, I chose plastics knowing that it was really competitive. And I think Mm -hmm. the issue there for me ended up being really like, because it was such a small specialty, especially at the time that I attempted to match, I think there were 90 spots in the entire country. And it was like the height of like plastic surgery interest, like the mm-hmm. surgery TV shows and everybody wanted to be a plastic surgeon. Um, so there was, I think close to 800 applicants for those 90 spots. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Wow. And so like, basically if you didn't, know someone, you weren't going to get a spot. And our program had two spots. And then that one went to one of our internal candidates who had known the program for like forever. Like she Mm -hmm. was like, I am plastics. And she had just like ingratiated herself to everybody there. And then the other spot was basically like kind of a trade, like an internal thing where like uh, one of our other applicants went to this other program and we got one of their applicants that they really liked. Mm -hmm. So I ended up unmatched. And that was kind of like my first, like, oh my God, what are you going to do now moment? And I was like, okay, well, I'm just going to research all of the programs that have um, prelim spots that also are plastic surgery programs um, that are known for taking prelim residents Mm -hmm. like after their third year or even have like a fellowship plastic surgery program so that maybe I could transition into the fellowship. Um, so I ended up matching in the scramble um, here in Sacramento. Oh, wonderful. Surgery. Okay, perfect. For a prelim surgery year, correct? But with For a PGY1 maybe. surgery year um, <laughs> with like the spoken contract that I would continue, you know, so long as yeah. I wanted to continue with the program. And maybe after my third year, I would transition into their prostics because they did have a transitional program oh. or I would complete all of my general surgery. And if I still wanted to do fellowship in plastic, yes, then fe- plastics fellowship. Yes. And I've definitely, I've heard of all those different routes, you know, to getting to really the same place. Yeah. Um, I do want to take a second though, to highlight, like, I really appreciate you sharing that story and, going into the OR for the first time, you know, having had vasovagal reactions like with dialysis and stuff. And I would love to share my first vasovagal reaction, which, you know, I think it surprises people. Like they feel like they are maybe more limited when they're pre-med or looking at medicine because they're like, well, what if I, what if I faint? It's like, honestly, 
most surgeons I know have fainted for, for one reason or another. But um, my first vasovagal came when I was an undergrad. I was a biochem major at Notre Dame and I was shadowing a hemonk guy in town. Mm. And he was awesome. He was such a good, he was like an old school doctor. He he was just great. And of course, a lot of hemonk, a lot of it was just very critical, you know, conversations with families. It was it was very interpersonal, a lot of pharmacology type of stuff, but then occasionally and I happened to be there one time when he had to do a bone marrow biopsy. Mm. This was on like a, you know, a girl in her twenties and the bone marrow biopsy, it honestly to this day may still be the biggest needle I've ever seen in my life. Like, of course it's a large bore needle. It's larger than anything that I use in my regular daily life now. Haven't seen anything like that big in years. And it's, it's, pretty famous for being painful. So like watching this awake person in pain, plus seeing that huge, I mean, super needle, like it was, it was unreal. I've, that device is still scary to me. Yeah. I just immediately passed out. And yep. you know, like nurses are ready for that. Everyone was nice to me about it. They just carted my body, you know, they just kind of put it up against a wall and then they gave me some orange juice and it was like, no problem. Mm -hmm. You know, I do think that like destigmatizing that for younger people or people who are interested it's good for them to hear. And I, yeah, so I just think that that's, that's great for people to know it's like not typically a big deal. I mean, I hope that it's like pretty rare that someone would be a jerk to you about it, especially if it's like early yeah. on and you're not decent. I think yeah. like the first time I ever passed out like that, I was actually, yeah, I was in high school and I was shadowing an ER doctor because I was like, yeah. I want to be a doctor. And they're like, okay, come shadow us in the ER. And like, there was just a kid came in to get stitches and I'm like, oh, this is so cool. And like, I remember being like very genuinely interested in what was happening. And the surgeons there, or the ER doctors putting in the stitches. And he, like, I just remember he's talking to me. And then he looks over and he goes, uh oh, we have a fainter. And like, I just, he was like, could yeah. see that all the color had like drained from my body. And I remember feeling weak, but still interested in what was happening. And like a chair just getting like shoved under me and like wheeled out of the <laughs> <laughs> yes and everyone was so nice and it was like it was funny like it was mortifying obviously to me I was a high schooler and yeah. I'm never gonna let me back in the ER again and everybody was like oh don't worry like people faint all the time like that is not the first time we've seen that so totally that's like think, welcome to the ER yeah. <laughs> yeah welcome to the team like you're one of us now I think if you've fainted you know in like a patient bay um, and this is the last one, but really quick, this story is so hilarious. And it's another example of what you're describing where like the trainee, the resident physician, they were hype. Like they were very pumped to be there. Um, but what happened was this is lore from my training program, but this resident was pumped to do their first case. Like they were opening the neck. This was a younger resident. So this was very new for them. So they have the scalpel in their hand and they're going to cut their neck. Well, guess what? They're, they're way too excited they end up cutting themselves. So they cut their other hand. So they, now they, they've cut themselves. Now they have a little laceration on their, their hand. And they were like, so upset. They were like, okay, okay. Just stitch it up like really quick. They're begging the attending. They're like, just please stitch it up really quick. And then I could just scrub back in and then maybe I could still do the case. Like I'm, I'm really ready. Like I really, really want this. And so the attending who tells the story, he was like, okay, you know, obviously a little setback. This is going to add some time, but he's like, fine, you know, whatever. And it was a clean scalpel that hit him. So he just like cleans it out and he's like, okay, I'm just going to stitch it. He puts the first stitch in resident immediately passes out. And so the, again, yeah, they just kind of finish stitching it. They kind of cart his body off to the side and he's like coming to when they're already well underway with surgery. And he's like, no, you guys left without me. Like you did it. And they're like, yeah, like you passed all, you totally lost consciousness. Like you're out, like you're not going to get to do this case, but hmm. It is, it's nice. It brings a little levity when stuff like that happens because pretty benign scenario. Yeah. Nobody got hurt. So that's always no. good. No. And so going back to your experience, so you're in Sacramento, you were a prelim mm -hmm. surgery resident. And what was your experience from that point? Um, you know, it's, it was interesting. I would say, you know, the, I didn't know too much about, programs as a whole or really I mean I'm I guess most people would say like I'm not just naive I'm kind of stubborn in a way like I have this belief that work shouldn't be hard right and it shouldn't 
make your life miserable. And like, maybe that is a wrong belief in surgery, but I was going to stick to that belief and I did not care what anyone else was going to say or do about it. Like I was there to do my work, be really good at my job and take really good care of patients. Like I loved patients, patients loved me. Like there were no issues there, but when it came down to it, like when work was done, I was going to go home. And I was not going to want to take that work home with me. Like if I'm on call, yes, I will answer my pager, but it doesn't mean I'm like sitting at home in a locked room alone waiting for my pager to go off. You know, at at one point I remember I had a partner and he had two kids and I got paged and I, you know, immediately answered and I started talking to the attending and he's like, what is that noise in the background? And I was like, that's two four-year-olds, you know, because they were twins and he's like, why are they making so much noise? And I'm like, because they're four? <laughs> like, I don't understand. And he's like, well, he's like, I can't, I can't think straight. I can't talk to you right now because like, there's just too much noise in the background. And I'm, he's like, you're going to have to go somewhere else and I'm going to have to call you back. And I'm Sounds like, like a cartoon villain. Yeah. But that, I mean, I won't say everyone in the program was a villain. Like there were some amazing people. Um, however, a lot of those people have since left the program because um, it was it turned out to be incredibly toxic and incredibly malignant. And I said, you know, like I said, some of that is probably due to like my own attitude, like they felt it needed adjusting. And it was a very hierarchical program. It's attached to um, also military operations. So there were times that we had to be working at the Air Force Base, which sucked I had no idea that was going to happen like they'd cart you off like over an hour away from home and you'd have to live in this gross hotel the entire time you were there and like residents got like ringworm and like there were bed bugs it was horrible and since we weren't military we had no access to any services while we were on base like we couldn't use the gym we couldn't buy gas like they would give us such a hard time. And I'm like, but we're here. Like we're serving in the hospital essentially. And they would just give us all such a hard time. So I really came to like despise most of the people in the program, but I kept showing up, right? Like I kept working hard. I kept doing my best, um, you know, to, to prove that I deserve to be there, honestly. Like And I don't know if part of that is like being a prelim or anything, but I, you know, I very easily, I had my second year given to me my, and after that, it was like, you were, you were a resident. Like it wasn't a year to year contract after that. It was like, okay, once you made it through intern year, um, I did, I scored the highest of all of the interns on the in-service exam. Like there was really no reason to cut me from the program at that point. So I continued into my second year and then through my third year. And then I did uh, research after that, I went into the lab and started working with um, mesenchymal stem cells for like oh, reconstructive cool. purposes. So, yeah. Um, and I already can hear, you know, in your voice, like, and I, I would say that I'm like-minded in that I do also think that, you know, I, I want there to be a world where being good at your job and treating people, you know, respectfully and with kindness at your job and showing up in day every day and doing your duty that that's good. Like Mm -hmm. if you meet those X, Y, and Z, like I, you know, I also like, I kind of believe, okay, if you check all those boxes, then, then you should be good. Although this gets a little bit into the, you know, cognitive distortions that we kind of talked about at the beginning, just, which is that there's like this fallacy of fairness. Cause I do think that that would be like a fair world. And I, I want to live in that world. Although the world we live in is like really unfair. So I can just already kind of hear you know, maybe where this is going, especially in a super yeah. hierarchical system. And I think it's hard, you know, just like for me, it's also hard a little bit to talk about because honestly, I can only tell what happened from my perspective and they can only say what happened from their perspective. So I could never tell you like, you know, from their point of view, maybe I was the worst resident ever. Like I have no idea, you know, at this point um, what caused the massive rift between myself and my um, residency program, because things seem like at least, you know, an intern year and everything, things seem like they started off great. Like I was like, Oh yeah, everyone likes me. I have a lot of friends. And 
when I, I think it was during my second year that I, I moved a bit further away. Like I moved out of downtown Sacramento, kind of to the suburbs. I moved in with this partner who had a couple kids and like, I had a life like outside and most of the attendings, like, yes, technically they had lives outside of surgery, but they didn't act like they had lives outside of surgery. And it became kind of like obnoxious, I think, to them to think that I had a life outside of surgery. At least, like I said, that's my perception was like, you know, the minute I kind of set these boundaries with them, they were like, oh no, like she cannot like survive in this system and like started making my life like really, really difficult. I mean, even the other residents made my life difficult. Like I had yeah. residents who would sexually harass me while I was working. Like they thought that for some reason they were allowed to do that because they heard other people saying things about me. And so it got to the point where like, I didn't, I didn't even want to go to work, but like, I still wanted so badly to succeed and to like be a plastic surgeon, but it became so apparent to me that that was not going to happen there. Right. Like even the plastic surgery program was very clicky. Like they all went to the same church and I, I don't go to church and like they were actually mostly guys. There was one female resident. She was the chief resident when I came on as an intern and then she graduated and all the rest of their residents were all males. Um, like all very pretty, <laughs> pretty males. <laughs> and, um, I just, and they all went to the same church and they all talked about the same things and they all got together all the time. And I was just like, this is, I am not going to fit in with this group, no matter how hard I try. And like, as, as at least as a woman, in my opinion, like we do that, like, like, I know I will just be this. And if I'm this, then everyone will like me and I will fit in. And I was like a master at like changing myself, Yeah, but only up until a point, right? Like if it came to impeding on like my lifestyle and my boundaries and in that it started to make me like uncomfortable. And I was like, no, like, yeah, I'm not giving you guys my free time too. Like you get all of my work time. You can't have my yeah. free time too. But I agree with you. I, I think especially in some surgical cultures, there is this agreement, like you don't have a life outside the hospital. And certainly even if you do on paper, it is not more important than the hospital. And mm -hmm. kind of, there's nothing more important than being here. And I do think that what's also tough is I've seen kind of a dozen different versions of like, if one person doesn't fit in, they're going to, they're going to know it. They're going to feel it because they, I've seen them ganged up on when I was a junior resident, one of the attendings told me, and this was like, under this was like a very pleasant conversation kind of like small talk on a very sunny day like this is just working in clinic and in between patients this attending said to me oh yeah every year the department picks the resident that they don't like and they make it very unpleasant for that resident and and I was like oh and you know I didn't say anything like I was a junior yeah. I was afraid I was kind of like afraid to hear that news Obviously, I've had many years to think about it since. And, you know, my question would be, why? Like, why is that, you know, why is that necessary? Why isn't it like, hey, there's only two residents every year. And then we had three every other year. But I mean, like, you know, why not if both those residents win, we all win. And like the department excels and things like that. But no, it really played out that way. Um, and I just think there's, you know, it's antiquated. It's oh, yeah. horrible. It's just like kind of, it comes off very animalistic to me. And so I'm, I'm sorry that you experienced that because it's, it's tough. And I can just already imagine a lot of those types of scenarios. And so, um, you know, I guess just kind of jumping ahead in time, I would just ask what your experience was like when you were led to quit. And then kind of those next steps, because you've talked a little bit publicly about your EM applications and things like that, yeah. if you could just walk us through. So I think, so it was around that time, so I became a research resident. Again, like I just went and I worked with one of the plastic surgeons, actually, he was a really super nice guy. Like um, he was a junior associate professor, right? Like just joined the group and he got his own lab and really wanted to do um, adipose derived stem cell um, work. So I'm like, well, can I help? Like, that sounds really cool. So we'd get fat pads out of rats and like break them down and grow the stem cells. 
and it was really fun and interesting. Um, and then right at the end of that year, I was like, you would sometimes rotate back on to service just to like cover for people who were on vacation or like for a week mm-hmm. here and there. So I was rotating back on to service and I had like a really bad like pain in my eye and I had slept with my contacts in. So I was like, it's just a corneal abrasion. Like I get them all the time because I had really dry eyes. Um, so I went to like my stash of these like prendazone eye drops basically that I would put on my eyes so that the inflammation would calm down and then I could put my contacts back in, but I was out. So I was like, well, that sucks. So I'm like, I got to find myself a uh, ophthalmology resident and I probably have some prendazone drops that they could get me. And so I got the ophthalmology resident and like we went to their little station up on like the eighth floor of the hospital and she looks in my eyes and she's like, I don't know. I don't see any corneal abrasion. She's like, but your eyes are really dry, like really bad. And so I think you should go see the corneal specialist. And like we all, the residents, we get these little plugs put in our eyes that like keep the moisture on your eyes longer. And she's like, so you should just go get that done and then you'll be fine. I'm like, okay. So I go over to the, I was like off to shift for the day and I was like, I may as well just pop by and they were able to see me. And so I come in and there's this medical student there. He's like, can I dilate your eyes? And I was like, no, like, please like go away. Like, I don't need my eyes dilated. I just want to get my plugs and go home. Like, I don't have want to do this. And I felt kind of bad because like, well, I don't really have anything better to do today. And he looks kind of sad. I was like, well, knock yourself out. Like, enjoy your beautiful view of my 29 year old pristine retinas, you know? And he looks in there and gets really quiet. And then the uh, resident looks and also gets really quiet and then they leave and the attending comes back and says like, yeah, we can definitely put the plugs in your eyes and we'll take care of that right away. She's like, but there's something else we should probably talk about. She's like, um, I, I don't know. Cause I'm just a corneal specialist, but it looks like both of your retinas are detached. And I was like, what are you talking about? No. Like, yeah. Yeah. I think they might be. So you should probably see a retinal specialist about that. And I was like, well, okay, when am I going to do that? She's like, no, like now, like immediately. Like I just told you both of your retinas are detached. <laughs> I was like, okay. So from there, um, you know, I shuttled off and I totally just, I mean, this was kind of like a long string of like health issues that I started having. Like my pancreas kind of felt like it was shutting down where I was like constantly hypoglycemic. Or like, I guess, overreacting in that way. And I actually started carrying around like Pez tablets to like every surgery. And I would have the nurses like pop them in my mouth while I was operating so that I didn't pass out. And uh, like I had seen an endocrinologist and like I was in the middle of getting all of this worked up. And now all of a sudden, like my retinas are detaching. And I was like, what in the world is happening? Um, so I just kind of started having a meltdown. And then my partner I was like, remember what you always say. And I was like, a chance to cut is a chance to cure. He's like, so they told you, did you have a surgical problem or a non-surgical problem? I'm like, a surgical problem. He's like, so great. Like, let them fix it and go on with your life. And I was like, yeah, okay. Like, that sounds fine. So I went and had surgery done like two days later, pretty much. Like, they just were like, this mm-hmm. has to be done now. It was yeah. so close to like my retinal artery. And it was just like a massive issue. So, um, from there I started to have some issues as far as like double vision and, um, I couldn't see very clearly, especially out of my right eye. And I wasn't sure how I could return to the lab at this point. I couldn't drive, like I couldn't do anything because mm-hmm. of the double vision and my, I had filed disability paperwork, like before I went out on leave, which happened to be the end of June, end of May, beginning of June, right? So we all know what happens in June, (laughs) new residents come in. So somehow I was told, and like people said that this also sounds kind of sketchy because like you're saying, like sometimes people are trying to push a resident out of the program, but I was told that my disability paperwork was lost because it somehow got filed away with all of this new resident paperwork. And the lady who was in charge of HR also retired apparently at the exact same time that my disability paperwork was filed. And they said, oh, we can't find it anywhere. So you either return to work tomorrow or you're going to need to quit or we're going to fire you. And I was like, what am I talking about? Like at this point I had been out for 
three months, I think, like recovering and still right. not fully recovered from the surgery. And I was like, this is crazy. Like, I don't understand. Like, I've been getting a paycheck. Like, I thought everything was fine. And they're like, nope, nope. Like, you need to do this right away. So I remember I talked to the head of the surgery department. She actually also had her lab in the same stem cell lab that I was working in. So I knew her from that. Um, and she was like, oh, like, it's okay. Like, it sounds like you're going to need to resign and we'll be happy to, you know, continue your medical insurance until you can find a job and we'll even continue your paychecks for like another two months. And, um, and then it was like, I think it was like August or September at that point. So she was like, you can even apply, you know, to the match and like, we'll make sure like you could match maybe into a new specialty that's better suited, you know, for your current <laughs> condition and all of this stuff. And I was like, yeah, sure. Like as a trauma resident, I often work with um, emergency medicine colleagues and I thought, well, I sure. think emergency medicine might be mm -hmm. okay. And like, I come to like find out later from like another attending colleague who had since left the program and like we met up for coffee one time and he's like, I just wanted to see how you're doing. Cause like kind of, it was like your situation where like everyone knows who the resident is that everyone has decided to like pin a target on the back of except the resident who kind of senses it, but doesn't really know. So like everybody else goes, well, yeah, it's terrible that nobody does anything about it. Yeah. You know? And he's like, yeah, you wouldn't, he's like, you think she was being nice to you. He's like, nothing happens without her sign off. Like, so like it seemed nice at the time and you were like, Oh, thank you so much for helping me quietly and nicely separate from this program who has made my life a living hell for the past three years. And I did that. I went and I applied for the match and I was like an excellent candidate right for EM at this point like I had three years of surgical training excellent scores even all the way back to medical school the one thing I didn't have that I didn't realize that I didn't have were excellent letters of recommendation it how did you find out I found out five years later since as an applicant you sign away your rights right. to ever read said letters of recommendation I found out from the person who had been the chief resident at the time in the EM program and he was trying to help me get a job. This was like years later after I'm not board certified in anything. It's really hard to get a job. Um, he was trying to help me get a job in like basically the fast track of an ER department that he worked at. And uh, he's like, do you know why you didn't match into emergency medicine? Because, like, you know, on paper, you are like the top candidate <laughs> for this position. And I was like, no, I just, you know, kind of assumed it just wasn't a good fit. And my life was going to go in a different direction. And I kind of didn't think about it after that. He was no, he was like, your residency program director wrote a letter about you so terrible that any program would have had to have been crazy to hire you. I was like, really? No. That person went out of their way to destroy my future as a doctor? Because like, for anyone who's not aware, like at the time it seemed like not being board certified, it does put a huge damper on your uh, prospects as a doctor. Like you can't contract with insurance companies. You can't get a job in a hospital system. Like it kind of seems like the only place you can get a job is in urgent care, which is not a you know, super awesome place to work. Having worked in one for like four years, I can tell you that firsthand. Um, but it's something that's like very important in like the medical world, but it turns out it's less important, I think, to patients than we think it is. But that, that really like hit me hard. Right. And like, I, I didn't really know what to do with that information. Honestly, I, I kind of just was like, I'm just going to put that back here where like, I'm like, but my life still worked out fine. You know, everything's fine. And, you know, like even up to last year, one of the doctors I had worked with reached out to me and like, you could tell he just been carrying around a guilty conscience. Like, Hey, like, how are you doing? Like, is your life okay? Are you okay? And I was like, my life is awesome. Like, are you okay? He's like, well, I've just, I've always thought about, and this is, mind you, 10 years after the incident. He's like, I just always thought about like what happened to you and how it was so terrible and like unfair. And I just, I just want to make sure you're okay. And like, I recently quit my job there and I'm moving down to Southern California. So I thought now would be a good time to talk to you. <laughs> like, okay. Yeah, and I'm, oh my gosh. I mean, I'm so sorry that that happened to you. I mean, it sounds like 
you're in an even better spot now. And I'm glad that you got out of a surgical residency experience where you describe it as your life was living hell. And, you know, I can certainly relate to aspects of that. And so I'm glad that you didn't have additional years in that kind of a traumatic, difficult situation. But You know, and it it really is crazy. I mean, certainly when you've written about the topic, it it did grab my attention. Like the fact that maybe one program director or one experience like that does have the ability, whether that's right or wrong, I'm not convinced that it's right, that Mm -hmm. they could then just end somebody's medical career. And like, especially what if that resident is like good at their job? They're respectful towards people, you know, no safety issues whatsoever. But yet maybe at somebody's subjective call that can still, that can be the end of it. And even more so, I I think that the literature even really does support like for women and underrepresented minorities in medicine, mm-hmm. things like that. Just if you're a person who does not fit in, you are definitely a candidate for being that person who gets singled out or gets a target on their back. Yeah. You know, like they're going to pick from that lot typically. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there was actually, I think it was an article that was published in JAMA that said there was just an alarmingly high rate of what they called unattended attrition <laughs> from residency programs by women and people of color. And it's like, well, why? Like, where are all the women and uh, minorities going? It's like, well, we're being told either to our faces or, you know, not so subtly in the actions of other people that we don't belong, that like we don't fit in and we're not welcome there. And the the programs know how to get us out. Like they have figured out the system, like you said, like for targeting them and for just making life really unpleasant. Like, like I said, to the point, it's like, how much do you value your life? Like for me, it was a lot. Like I, I value my life and I I feel really sorry for the residents who feel like their life's not worth living because this happens to them. Right. And I have talked to these residents. Like I have talked to people who, who approach me for like any number of reasons. Most of them have been targeted by residency programs and it's heartbreaking. Like it's hard for me on the days that I like hear their stories. Like I have to spend a lot of time um, reprocessing, I think what happened to me in addition to like feeling their pain. Like I'm a very empathic person in that way. Um, And it's really hard to hear like that this toxic culture and residency, you know, not only still exists like in this year, 2024, but it's like perpetuating and there's no recourse and there's no consequence, right? Like, I mean, cause people are like, well, why didn't you call a lawyer? And why didn't you do this? I was like, I did. <laughs> they were like, yeah, but since you signed away your heiress rights and the program could just as easily have destroyed all the evidence, like it's really your word against theirs or maybe these other people. And, you know, if you talk to those people again, they're like, oh, I didn't say that. Like, don't don't ask me to testify, you know, against right. this program. So it, well, of course, you know, this it's hard for me to talk about because I'm like, oh my god, like if somebody hears this, they're gonna say like something because they know who who I am and where I went and who the program director is and all that stuff. So it's like, well, now is that person gonna come after me? Well, and even like you said, like people didn't even feel comfortable to reach out to you until they left that program. And right. I've heard multiple, you know, similarly where residents leave programs and people who are still in the department are told not to contact them, yep. you know? And so then they feel even more isolated. Like it's just, it, it, my heart goes out to you because it seems like, of course, incredibly distressing to have to go through that. But I do want to make sure that, you know, we spend time on, really the good part. And like, I'd love to basically, you've already alluded to it, but you are an expert at this based on your experience, you know, based on the things that you've learned, the wisdom you have from your unique journey. And so your advice on career setbacks, you know, Mm -hmm. something this major, this unexpected, but of course coming out much stronger on the other side, you know, the incredible life and career that you have now, like we'd love to hear all about of course. I think it's important like too, that we talk about this stuff just because 
like I said, still happening. And despite like, you know, the wonderful things that can, you can still become with your life. Like I would definitely not advocate for anyone ending their life ever for this reason, especially. <laughs> um, but it's just like, we don't want to skim over the bad that happened just because it turned out for the best. And I think I spent most of my life doing that. Like, well, I was able to be resilient because right. We are physicians and we are very resilient people, most of us. And, um, that's how we define ourselves. We shouldn't have to define ourselves that way and constantly face like this, like surreal amount of like abuse and trauma that a lot of us have to go through, even if it's not at the level of being targeted. I think many programs just like excel at ripping your humanity away from you and making you feel like that's the only way to survive and to become a good doctor who's very dedicated to your profession is just to become dehumanized. And like that definitely needs a change. So I don't want to skim over like that portion of it. Um, but just coming back to it, it's like, yeah, at first I was like, what am I going to do? Like I was supposed to be a surgeon, like a surgeon is like amazing. It's the best job ever. And I went to work in an urgent care and it was like being demoted from like the sommelier at the fanciest restaurant you can think of to like behind the counter at a McDonald's. Like people would say really rude things to me all the time. And like when you were used to just like walking into a room and saying like, I'm going to take your organs out, sign here, you know, and people like, yes, please. Thank you. I'm in so much pain. I can't wait to be rid of this appendix. Um, And you're just like, Hey, you have a cold. What do you know? Where are you from? are you from another country? And it's like, no, I'm like literally from Wisconsin. It's just a few States over the other direction. Um, so that part can be hard, right? Like you, so you're, you feel like you're being completely like stripped of your prowess and everything that you earned. Right. And so I think that goes back to some of those like cognitive fallacies that you were talking about. It's just like, I earned this, I should be treated differently. Like I need this in order to like be recognized and, and it's an identity death. It is. It's like a huge identity death. Like you're just like, I don't know what to do at this point. But again, it's like you start to look around you and you start to see that like this is just one facet of who you are. And I would be very fortunate to to think about these words that were said to me when I was an undergrad. And I had this mentor and he had said that you're a tree. And all of these other things are just birds. So if you see yourself as a surgeon, as a doctor, as a mother, as, you know, anything, the birds can come and go, but it doesn't change the nature of the tree. Like a tree still exists and it still provides so much value to the world. So why would you identify just with the flightiness of birds? And so that was something that was really true for me. Like, yes, I could still be a doctor. You know, I worked at the urgent care. Eventually I um, transitioned from urgent care to telehealth back in 2016. So it was like a super new field at the time. And because I had this ability to create great relationships with people and relationships with patients, you know, I was chosen to be a medical director of like this startup telehealth company who was trying to figure out how they could create continuity of care within telemedicine because like so many telehealth companies at the time and even to this day they're one-off platforms right like Mm -hmm. you get a doctor to talk to you about your cold and it's just like that urgent care experience like but if you come back the next day that doctor isn't there now there's some other doctor who you have to tell your whole life story to all over again But we really wanted to create a touchless care platform for injured workers where they would start with you as their doctor from the time of injury all the way until discharge. And you would just manage all of the care remotely without ever having to like lay hands on them. So there was this whole new opportunity at the time to define what would eventually like I think coined by like maybe Amwell or Peladoc, somebody called it, started calling it website manner, you know? And I was just like, it's just treating people like humans. (laughs) Like I was like, so the only tool really at your disposal in telehealth is your ability to connect with somebody remotely. And I read in a old medical textbook that said like 85% of diagnosis is actually good history taking. And I was like, well, 
then obviously I could diagnose more people via telehealth than I could in a clinic setting, even because I have way more time on my hands to just talk to them and listen. Like this is my main tool is listening. And so we developed this whole like, um, you know, website manner protocol where we could teach doctors to be human again and listen to people and hear what they had to say. And also kind of look around their environment. Like, do you see, are there other people in there? Is there something that maybe looks hazardous to them as they have this back injury or something um, that you could talk to them about? So we just became like really good observers. And that really just helped change the trajectory of how I saw myself and made me a, a leader in the space because it was such a new space and there was a lot of opportunity to kind of step forward and to say like, this is the way we think that other human beings should be treated in the realm of telemedicine. And this is why telemedicine is important and to really like defend it as um, a tool and as a care, a place of care rather than most people were just like, oh, what's that? Like telemedicine, that sounds weird. Yeah. And it wasn't until COVID that people really saw the utility of it. Um, but I started doing that in 2016. Yeah, but that's awesome that you were on the front. Yeah, exactly. Like you had already been in that space. So I would imagine that was really like a gift to be at the right place at the right time in terms of the whole telemedicine movement and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I do want to say that I completely agree with, you know, what you mentioned about, like, we shouldn't glaze over the bad parts. Like some of this stuff that happens in graduate medical education, it Unfortunately, some of it is life ending for some physicians. We know physician suicide is a real issue. And so I absolutely agree with you. We don't glaze over the ugly bits, you know, um, certainly in this podcast on my site, Rethinking Residency, like I actually do believe in talking about the, the ugly bits in part because then we can prepare others for them or like think about ways we could improve or do them better or think about ways that the culture can change, like what you've mm -hmm. alluded to. Yep. But then what I think is also awesome and I really appreciate you sharing is the other side where yes, you very much lived and created, you know, and then you happen to be, I don't mean happen to be like, I'm not belittling this. This is incredible. You happen to be at an incredible position, a very, you know, you really advanced your position. And then when COVID happened, I would imagine being a leader in the telemedicine space is just incredible you know? Yeah. yeah, it's been fun. And, and honestly, it's, it's going back to like that part of me that, that says that it's not okay to keep impeding on other people's boundaries, right? Like I said, it's not okay for me. And like, I don't tell other people what to do because I don't like being told what to do. Like that is just the number one thing that people should know about me is that I'm out here trying to create a better system and a better paradigm for doctors because the way that we've been treated and trained is wrong. And it only entrains us to continue to participate in the broken healthcare system that is run completely on our backs and tears at this point. And in some cases, like you said, blood, like doctors have fed the system for too long and the doctors who were abused have become the bullies. And it's this perpetuating cycle of victims and abusers that just can go on and on and on indefinitely. And the only people winning in this scenario are huge healthcare organizations and hospitals and insurance companies. Like no doctor is winning in this. Like, so you can be a bully all you want and be self-righteous in that, but it doesn't benefit you. It doesn't benefit anyone else. And it definitely doesn't benefit patients like we're finding. So Agreed. sticking to my authenticity and what I believed was right for me and like knowing that I deserved to have a life, that I was worthy of living my life and having a family and being a multifaceted person and that that didn't make me a bad doctor. Like knowing that and carrying that forward helps me continue to, you know, push other doctors just a little bit harder to envision their life as a practicing physician outside of this paradigm that we've all been trained into. And like, like, you know, you're living like, you know, private practice allows you to be who you want to be, to treat your patients, how you want to treat them and to still live your life as yourself, to be authentic, to be human. But I think the hardest and first step in that for most doctors is like re-grasping their own 
identity and their own sense of authenticity because to survive in this program for so long and as long as they have, it's like amazing that like they have made it this far, but they've been stripped of something so vital to themselves and they need help recovering that part of themselves and to know that that part of them is good, that that part of them is beautiful. And that part of them is actually like the key to marketing and attracting patients to your practice. Like just be yourself and say, hi, I'm a doctor. I want to help you. Like patients love it. Like marketing is not like that hard when you're a doctor, honestly. (laughs) Well, especially if you can be yourself, because I agree, Mm -hmm. we're just along the journey, pre-med to med school, to beyond graduate medical education, like we are definitely very much taught subconsciously to hide the parts of ourselves that are otherness in any way. Um, Because otherwise, you know, like we've talked about, that target may be put on your back. And so like keeping your head down, trying to blend in for some of us, it works better than others. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, that, that is very much part of the journey and it should not be because agreed, like typically I think a lot of the best doctors I know have a lot of broader perspective and variety that they bring like a diversity aspect um, that certainly it's worth thinking about. And I do want to end with, I ask everybody, do you believe in karma? No, I do. in the fact that like, when you are, you have this belief in other people's self-worth because you have this belief in your own self-worth, I think. <laughs> like at least those, those of us who are good. I think some people who are narcissists believe in their own self-worth and not others, but most of us good people believe in in the inherent worth of, of ourselves and others. And so for that reason, we treat people well and people treat us well in return because they feel that shared connection in humanity. Whereas when you get the reputation for treating other people's people poorly, like we are a human society who, you know, for better or worse, loves to gossip. And we will always tell other people who treated us well and who treated us poorly. And in the end, if you have a habit of treating other people poorly, that is definitely going to come back and bite you in the butt. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate you joining me today, Dr. Bussey. And it's just been such a pleasure, you know, to learn about you and your story and your current work now. Thank you so much. It was a fun conversation. A little traumatic for me at times, but I'll survive. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Well, sincerely, you know, thank you for being so candid with us and your story, which you have shared in a variety of ways. It must make people feel less alone when they have similar experiences in their own graduate medical education, you know, journeys. Yeah. And just anyone can reach out to me anytime just to like put that out there. Like I'm on LinkedIn. That's the best place to find me. And if you want somebody to tell your story to, I am here, I will listen to you and I might not be able to help, but I can at least listen. Thank you so much. Yes. We'll absolutely, we'll put all your information in the show notes below and all righty. So follow me on Instagram at at francismay.md and at rethinking residency. Visit my website, rethinkingresidency.com to learn more about resident physician stories and ways that residents can most effectively navigate the game of residency. I cannot wait to connect with you on the next episode of Promising Young Surgeon.